right. So it's, <clears throat> I believe, Wednesday, Thursday, August 27th. Yes, my sister's birthday is happy birthday, sisters. Um, and this is Senate Government Operations. So my understanding is that, Erica, you have some time constraints. <clears throat> is that right? Yes, that's correct. OK, so um, we, we're, what we're doing is looking at the CR, uh, the Appropriations Committee has asked us to look at the CRF funding, what's gotten out, how many, um, I, she had like a few questions, and I think you might have been forwarded those questions. Was there pro, um, issues setting it up and launching it? How many applicants have received money? How much money in, under? unencumbered money and then what issues have been raised as a result of this. So um, we're looking at uh, DPS. And so Eric, I guess you're talking to us about particularly emergency management. Is that right? Um, yes, that's correct. And for the okay. record, uh, my name is Erica Borneman. I'm the director of Vermont Emergency Management. Um, so thank you very much for, uh, for giving me the opportunity um, to talk with you folks about this and um, allowing me to, to go first. I have, a, I'm, I'm like stacked up and booked with Zoom meetings and calls for the whole <laughs> afternoon. So I really appreciate this. Um, so uh, as, as you may or may not know, um, the Joint Fiscal Committee allocated uh, $15 million in uh, response cost uh, uh, funding out of uh, the CRF um, in one of the, the first uh, appropriations um, once, we, once we first received the money. Um, that funding is meant to uh, cover response costs, um, particularly response costs that uh, require a match um, for, uh, for FEMA, um, uh, for, for uh, FEMA requests for reimbursement. Uh, that funding is also to cover that, what, what, uh, that which may not be eligible for FEMA, but was a uh, Department of Public Safety State Emergency Operations Center response cost. Um, it is uh, also meant to cover the match requirement, the non-federal match requirement of all municipalities that are applying for, uh, for FEMA funding for COVID-19 response. Um, and that's really the first time this, that this has happened. Normally, uh, local jurisdictions have a uh, non-federal match requirement, part of which is covered by the state and part of which is, is covered by, uh, by the municipality itself, um, depending on a, a number of factors on a sliding scale. Tip, like the, the worst that they um, might be uh, obligated to would be about 17 and a half percent of their total uh, eligible disaster costs. Um, best case scenario, they might have to pay seven and a half percent. But um, in this case, they have to pay 0% of their eligible response costs because uh, have uh, a RF allocation that can, can cover that. Um, so- Erica, could I interrupt in terms one of, second? Go ahead. Just, go ahead. would you um, just I, I define for me and maybe others already know, but what you're calling response calls. Response costs. Like a response Sorry. costs, yeah. The, thanks. Right. So, um, the back in um, in March, the state of Vermont and every state in the country received a major disaster declaration uh, for COVID nineteen um, response, and we uh, were approved for um, costs that fell under the category of emergency protective measures. So those are things like uh, personal protective equipment, um, disinfection, um, testing, uh, um, it, pretty much anything that uh, the, the state or municipalities need to do to respond to COVID-19. Um, it covers personnel hours uh, for overtime um, and, uh, and it covers uh, the costs related to um, uh, mobilizing and operating and demobilizing alternate care sites. 
It covers costs um, such as non-congregate sheltering, um, emergency feeding. So pretty much anything that is um, essential for uh, the protection of life safety throughout an event is an eligible uh, emergency protective measure. And that's what we were approved for. DPS and VEM administers the FEMA public assistance program, which is those that that's the disaster funding that we receive um, uh, under that major disaster declaration. So, um, so we were, uh, we thus far, um, the Department of Public Safety has about $28 million in response costs. Um, thus far, across the state, uh, including all state agencies and municipalities, um, there's about $53 million in, uh, in what think are eligible have been um, scoped and are getting ready to be submitted to FEMA for reimbursement. Uh, there is a September 1st deadline for applicants to submit um, costs that have been incurred up until June 30th. And one of those reasons that's very important is so that we can give an accurate picture to you folks um, about what what the total uh, match requirement budget might be out of the CRF. Um, so DPS has about $15 million. There's a number of other agencies that have uh, CRF allocations that would cover this non-federal match requirement. Um, we have gone through, um, we're obligated uh, to about half of that $15 million thus far. Um, we, we also, we don't have a really good idea. We don't think it's gonna be that much, but we don't have a really solid idea of how much, um, how much match is gonna be required for municipalities. What we've been seeing thus far though, is it's really only a few thousand dollars per municipality. Um, so, and, and there's and not, and there's certainly not all municipalities are applying for their costs because some of them just didn't have significant costs. Um, and uh, we are, we, we anticipate um, going through all that funding um, because as we look towards the future and as we look towards the winter months with flu and, uh, and the overlay of COVID-19 and the ongoing response, as well as the need uh, to um, prepare for and execute execute or support uh, vaccination operations when they become um, available, uh, those, are, those are all costs that will, um, we think will be um, at least in part eligible uh, for FEMA and will require a non-federal match. And I'll just, I'll, I'll end it on this one point. The other reason that an important DPS um, uh, maintains a pot of funding for uh, for match is uh, we there's there's some inconsistency across the country right now with FEMA in terms of um, what they're going to uh, moving forward deem eligible for uh, federal assistance and not um, that's got us a little bit worried and so um, this funding would not only cover match requirement but it would cover things that are deemed ineligible by FEMA, but we need to have a, a funding source to be able to pay for them. So um, we have not, um, what, when you look at our, our balance sheets, if you will, you'll see that uh, DPS doesn't appear to have spent much of that money at all, but that's because we have to go through the entire application process with FEMA, um, have that funding approved and or not, and then the match is drawn down. So it actually may take a little while for it, it to show that the, uh, that the match is being drawn down. So I think I've answered all of the questions. I haven't gone through them uh, number by number, but I think I've answered all of them in the course of my explanation. And I'm happy to take any questions. Does anybody on the committee have a question right now? I have to admit that I'm a little confused by the, by some of the numbers that um, I, I thought that 
the, the 15 million is what is in reserve for the match and for things that aren't covered. And you've expended about half of that and the rest is waiting on um, applications to be denied. Um, but then what is the, so VEM has incurred about 28 million and in costs and you figure that across the state, there's about 53 and where is that um, coming from that 53? And is it is the 53 and the 28, do they get added together or is it the 53 includes the 28? The 53 does not include all of the 28 yet. Okay. <laughs> and I could get really complicated in my answer here, but um, the 53 million is what has been scoped thus far. So that's basically what we what we know of, um, of all of the costs of the applicants thus far. What I'll just qualify that by saying that um, for DPS, for example, we haven't scoped all of our costs. So when I said we have 28 million in costs, uh, we haven't applied for all of those yet because we're still compiling all of our documentation. So um, I do expect the, the $53 million to go up. Um, I, I can't say how, by how much, but I, I do expect it to go up. Um, and uh, the DPS has incurred about 28 million in, in costs thus far. And when I said we have uh, about seven and a half million of our 15 million that we were allocated, that's, uh, we have about seven and a half million committed. So we're, that's our projection um, for our costs thus far. And that's how much we have um, committed. Although that's not what you would see as uh, having been drawn down if you looked at our balance sheets yet. So the 58 or the growing 58 will, um, is what you're going to apply to, is what is being applied to FEMA. It isn't coming out of the CRF money that we got up front, is that right? Um, the the match for all of the um, all of the match for anything applied to FEMA for is coming out of the CRF in one right, way. Right, the another. fifteen. Well, it's not just the fifteen though. Okay. It's um, so DPS has an allocation of fifteen for DPS's cost in municipal costs. Okay. Um, AHS has a has an allocation. Yeah. Um, there are hospitals and healthcare providers that AHS is working with. Um, uh, I can't remember what the program is now, but they're asking them to do, go through FEMA um, and then uh, they will cover any of the ineligible costs through CRF as well as the match. Um, and so that's, it's being handled um, a little bit differently and we're tracking it across the state, um, but uh, pretty much any, any uh, any costs that are being applied to for FEMA, the intent is that the CRF would be uh, the match source for that. Okay, got it. Allison? Oh, uh, actually, Erica, I'm, as con I'm a little confused as Jeanette is, uh, you know, in terms of the numbers, it might help us if, if, you, if you were able to send us a sort of an update interim sheet, a sheet with the numbers on it and what is expected of what of each bucket and in what's expected to be matched, what's expected to be reimbursed and, and you use the terms reimbursed or matched. I don't know if they're the same. Um, and what's in your bucket, what's DPS bucket, what's UA AHS bucket? What are the buckets that make up the 53 million thus far? I, I think that would be helpful for us to be on that. paper. Uh, yeah, I'm I just, happy to write a breakdown of that. Okay, I just I just want to make clear in my own head though that the 53 or whatever that number is is not coming out of CRF funds that were allocated as part of the 1.2 billion. That is being applied to FEMA. I mean, applications are being sent to FEMA for that for that money. So that if if all 53 or 60 million came in that's money that isn't in the state right now. And that this 15 is being used to match what that, the 15 came out of the CRF funds for DPS to use as match for um, uh, either things that were denied or municipal match. Am I right about that? Is that 
So you've got the you've got the last part right. Um, so fifty three million is what has been scoped thus far as uh, as damages that could be eligible for FEMA and that yeah. we're applying for FEMA for that funding. Okay. FEMA only covers seventy five percent of that. Yeah. So uh, twenty five percent needs to be matched uh, by the state, um, yeah. and we're allowed to use CRF funding for as a match source. So when we when we get through the application process um, uh, for that funding, we'll still need to we will be obligated to pay twenty five percent of that of of those total costs mm -hmm. uh, as a state. Yep. DPF has an allocation that is to cover the the non federal match requirements of DPS and the non federal match requirements of municipalities right and, and other state agencies have uh have allocations of the crf that is uh, that are meant to cover their non-federal match requirements as well right some of and so when i say 53 million it's 53 million dollars in damages thus far and therefore we'll have a 25 percent match requirement as a state mm -hmm. um and that's in in counting um and that match is coming out of um, multiple different uh, yeah. state agency budgets. Right. So, but yours is 15 million to cover yeah. your unmatchable funds. That's or, correct. Okay, good. Okay. I think I got that finally. I don't know if anybody else has questions. I could go on all day about public assistance and I could confuse the heck out of everybody. So <laughs> I'm sure you <laughs> could, you've, you've confused me more than once in the past. <laughs> so so I, I guess for me, so what's important for us to clarify in those damages is it, it, we need to do that fairly soon, I assume, because if we want to keep and use, uh, and it's the 25 match, the 25% that we, is uh, that the state is obligated to pay that we're hoping CRF will be able to cover, right? That's correct. So, right. and that's why I mentioned the September 1 deadline. Right, um, right. So the agency of administration has made a September 1 deadline for applicants to ensure that they at least let us know what they have for potentially eligible damages um, and apply for those. Um, and so we're well on our way for that, but that's really so that we can give a more accurate picture of what we think um, the match obligation is going to be. Um, but you know, there's there's some caveats to that. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what um, our response costs are going to be at, throughout the winter. And the state emergency operations center center is activated virtually every single weekday, um, and has been activated since March 11th, uh, supporting this response and supporting the health department. So um, we are we are very um, cognizant that we could have a ramp up of operations uh, again this winter, and that will result in additional costs. I'd like to ask you one more question before you have to run, unless somebody else has them. Yesterday we uh, heard from um, Doug Farnham around the municipal granted. I think it's twelve point six million, and that what. So this 15 uh, could cover some of the costs that aren't covered in their applications to FEMA, some of the match money or, and then the 12.6 is money that um, goes to them that, they're, that they wouldn't be eligible um, for FEMA. Is that what so the way I understand So that? in order for municipalities that are applying for the Elger grants, Mm -hmm. um, local government emergency response grants, I think that's what mm -hmm. they're called. Um, yeah. they, they actually first need to apply through FEMA. Mm -hmm. Our folks are working with uh, the Department of Taxes. I think they're the ones that are administering this. Mm -hmm. um, and anything that's not eligible in, their, in terms of a municipal, mu municipality's total package um, will then get funneled over to the, uh, through the Elger grant process. So the idea is that a municipality should only have to apply once um, for, for disaster funding and it would either be covered by FEMA or it'd be covered um, through the Elger, Elger grant process. And I know that the, the, the 
VLCT and the development corporations all across the state have um, been doing webinars for towns so that they can, um, so they expect a lot of applications to come in in the next few days. Right. Well, yeah. Allison? That also includes the hazard pay of, if municipalities, I mean, this is right. I mean, that's. The 12.6? Yeah, that's where the, the municipalities are also having to apply separately for the hazard pay piece. And that's through the Elger thing as well, the Elger uh, funnel as well, isn't it? Yeah, the hazard pay is not an, uh, an eligible um, uh, activity under FEMA. So right. that, therefore they would, they would directly um, be directed to uh, the Elger grant. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So whatever isn't out that isn't eligible or what they're, um, the, and then the match that they would have to do would be coming out of the 15. Right, right. <laughs> I'm glad you're able so, to I mean, track that's, of this. It's really important that municipalities go through FEMA first mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's what's uh, allowing us to stretch our CRF dollars. Uh, if we can get the eligible costs covered under FEMA and it's not coming out of our CRF allocation, we can stretch our CRF allocation that much further. Right. Um, but it's a really important first step that they make sure that their eligible costs um, are recovered through FEMA first. So does anybody have any more questions um, to confuse us even more? Any committee members? I don't see anybody. Okay, well, thank you. That was very helpful. No um, problem. And I, and I have a, a due out here. I will be sending a, a breakdown of um, what is currently scoped thus far. And because uh, we, we do track that uh, regularly. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. And thanks for all the, the work that you've been doing. It's great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, should we, um, who, who else do we have with us here? I see we have Chris Raquel. Um, do we have anybody else? Oh, Bill Boniak is here. Yep. And Jennifer Harlow. Oh, and Jennifer Harlow is here. Okay. So um, were you guys going to talk about, um, I guess, we, we had on our list um, as part of kind of DPS, the <coughs> sheriff's budgets and also the training council and um, anything else in DPS that um, we need to hear about. So who, who wants to start off here with, does anybody have else have any time constraints that they're working under? You mine if you wish, Madam Chair, mine are fairly insignificant and small. Hey, we'll hear from you. Very good. Uh, thank you. Chris Burkell from Brandon, again, representing the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. And specific to the questions that were asked, I checked with the budget analyst for the academy. And what I learned through them is that um, for the fiscal year 2020, there was a total of $14,490.87 that came from the CRF fund. And that for the 2021 uh, current year, essentially we've got in now, well, there's been $13,000 spent that has not been applied for yet. And once that's applied for, and if that's granted, then they'll be doing the 75% reimbursement match through FEMA. We're talking a total of $27,490. Jeez, that's not very much. Do you know what that was for? I can tell you that in the first uh, round that that was for salaries, um, essentially the salaries of the employees at the academy, and the rest was uh, the the thirteen thousand was for. I don't have the list in front of me now, but it was a, a list of equipment um, upgrades to laptops and um, projectors, since they were having to do remote uh, teaching and taking shows on the road and equipment for uh, scenarios, new um, head and safety gear for the recruits to be wearing. 
And one other thing that was on that list was the replacement of the third um, touchless bottle refilling station. So it, it replaces an old water fountain. So it's touchless because the recruits constantly have to rehydrate. So that's, I can give you the entire list. Uh, no. <laughs> but uh, there at one point um, I saw a, a grant application for, it was somewhat over a million dollars for the training for the academy and it paid for um, uh, <clears throat> lodging for recruits and lodging for, was that CRF money also and was it a separate? That was not, that, that was the Corona Emergency Relief Fund. So it was a different fund altogether. And it didn't come through the state, it was, you applied directly to that? Nope. It did come through the Department of Public Safety. Um, they submitted a grant that was through the CERF uh, grant process in which they were the pass-through for funds to the academy. And that was, in fact, for the uh, COVID-19 academy class I went through, which was training, lodging, overtime, mm -hmm. deals, and such. Okay, but that didn't come out of the $1.2 billion that we originally? As I understand it, it did not. Okay, yeah, that, I did see that it was a separate grant. So, okay. Any questions for Chris? I'm not sure you really needed that third water cooler though. You better <laughs> be able to justify that. <laughs> I'll have people on it, trust me. <laughs> Any questions for Chris? Thank you. Can I just ask another question? Absolutely. That, well, I guess I can, I'm the chair, but um, where I haven't, uh, I must admit that I've not paid very close attention. Where are we with um, hiring a, a, an ED? Very close. Um, there, my understanding is that there has been approval that the final details on salary are being worked out as we speak. Oh, great. Allison? Yeah, and Chris, remind me, it, it, you did a national search for that? There was a national search, yes, that's correct. Great. I think, and it, I think if, if all works out, everyone will be very pleased with the candidate. Good. Right. Well, as soon as you know, send us all a note. We will certainly do that. <clears throat> Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. Somebody <laughs> asked me the other day, Chris, and I should know the answer, but I couldn't immediately recall it. How many people are on the training council? I said around... 23, 24? There are 12 currently, and there is talk, and there has been much talk the last session of increasing the size and adding uh, other organizations to the actual, which would increase it greatly. Okay, but it's 12 right now. Yeah, and we're, I think our bill proposed that we're more, it will end up being more like 18. Yeah, I think so. Okay, that is the number. Thank you. You're welcome. And that's in S124 if anybody cares to look. Correct. Right. That's where I remembered it from. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Any more questions for Chris? Thank, thank you. you. For, thank you for keeping the ship together, keeping the ship st steered in the right direction. Uh, we're getting a lot of help trying to do that, but thank you. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, Jennifer, what is very specific are you going to talk to us about? Um, well, I spoke with um, Sheriff Anderson um, this morning, late this okay. morning. So I'm sorry that I'm not as prepared for this as I probably should be. Um, but some of the concerns or some of the... Would, the would, you, would you just identify yourself, please? Oh, for the sorry. Jennifer Harlow, Orleans County Sheriff. Sorry about that. That's okay. Bill Boniak is here too, just so that you know. I'm sure you can see him. He's little there. So, um, so I guess it's really too soon for us to say really too much of anything because um, we're just starting to get guidance on it this week about what's going to be happening. Um, the applications are still out, as you guys know, so we don't really know what how many people have put in what the funds are going to be, um, what people are going to be receiving at this point. Sorry, hold on.
And the current, some of the concerns are that there was a 200, um, you know, per county cap put on this with a dollar or two dollars per person. So that's really our county small. Um, I think Chinton was at 160 thousand. So I guess there's some, you know, what that's going to look like. Some of those side judges have allocated some monies, but I guess they're not going to be eligible for the entire monies that they put out. So that's part of um, the concerns as well. But and we're not sure if the entire state is going to put in applications or not. I mean, if they all put in applications, then but the likelihood of that happening, I'm not positive on. But so far, you haven't received the, as far as you know, the sheriffs haven't received any COVID funds except maybe what the side judges gave, which isn't really COVID funds. It's not the CRF funds. That is my understanding, Madam Chair, yes. Okay. Bill, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yes, and for the record, it's Bill Boniak, Orange County Sheriff. Um, far as I know, as far as the counties, I believe uh, Sheriff Anderson may be the only one who applied to the counties. Um, you know, currently this $1 um, per person per county, like uh, I'll give you an example, I'll use Orange County. Um, the first two and a half months of COVID, you know, we, we lost approximately about $78,000 in revenue uh, that we, we would normally, we averaged it out for a three year average. And uh, in Orange County, our population is roughly 29,000. So um, that doesn't even, it doesn't come close to, um, it helps, but we're, some of the sheriffs, you know, and I'll probably be one of them, uh, where we'll see an effect is when uh, December, January, February come around, that's where um, the money that we make during the summer carries us, carries us over. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> some sheriffs are doing, you know, very well, um, because of COVID, you know, with the, yeah. how should I put this, the babysitting of uh, the motels, hotels, where the homeless are in, um, like Lamoille, and I think Caledonia is doing pretty good with that. And uh, some of the summer jobs are picking up a little bit now. Hopefully, you know, that'll help. But we're still, there's several of us are still operating, you know, with the, um, you know, looking at lost revenue. So, you know, once we get a better handle on where we're at with that, you know, we'll, you know, we'll keep in touch with the entire you know, Seneca of Ops and we appreciate everything you do for us. Yeah, it would be, it would be, it would be good to keep an eye on how much loss there is. If um, I know that at one point, Mark had put that together. That was a couple months ago though. Um, and it would be good to have an update of that. And so you're on the other end of the, of the COVID. You didn't get money to start with and are telling us how, to, how you spent it, but you're on the other end of, you're on the receiving end of it and have lost considerable funds um, that, well, we have to figure out a better way of, <clears throat> have I ever said this before, a better way of funding our sheriff's offices? <laughs> Hello. Okay. Anyway, Allison. Oh, and Anthony, did you have a question? Well, just a quick thought. Um, what I think I'm hearing is that the real losses that you might experience later on in the winter, that part of what you said, which is then harder to reimburse those because we don't know what kind of monies will be available after after December. You know, you're, you're absolutely right. And uh, so where I'm going with this would be to, if we could show our actual loss for the first uh, few months of COVID, <coughs> and ask for those monies, uh, you know, you know, within the next, you know, month or so, um, this way we'll, we'll have that money and we'll able, to, that'll be able to carry us over. Right, through the winter, yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so if you could, if you can get that to us soon, we could, we will um, forward that to the Appropriations Committee with some suggestions maybe of where uh, it might even come from. I you know that one one um, pot of money that we talked about the other day, it seems is going to have about a million of unencumbered funds by the end of it. So 
there might be some places where they just aren't able to spend the money that was allocated and those might be sources for putting more money into this. Yes, and as you're fully aware, the Vermont sheriffs were in a unique position of being a government entity um, and also the, the business side, you know, we're the only sheriffs in the nation who are funded um, or not funded this way. Um, and, you know, as being a government entity, we were not, av we're not available for the, the PPP money that was out there. Uh, we, we, we looked at it. We, we, um, I actually wrote uh, the SBA a, a letter that went from our, from Montpelier to Washington DC for, um, for a waiver, which was denied uh, because their answer was, the sheriffs are a government entity and they will be publicly funded. Well, not here in Vermont, so. Yeah, our, the way our setup is, um, causes all kinds of troubles that nobody understands. I know, I remember with um, when Irene hit and the funds were supposed to go through the county uh, government and we don't have any county government really. So it took um, practically an act of God to allow the money to go through the regional planning commissions because they were kind of the only um, county organization that we had that dealt with the um, devastation from Irene. So we have we are set up in a unique way here and maybe we should be looking at that. You know, some uh, over the years, I've been a sheriff now for 14 years and over over the 14 years, um, I heard everything from the fellow sheriffs that have been here um, many, many years before me. And uh, they say, well, you can open a can of worms sometimes by looking at this. Um, you know, s some sheriffs do very well with that, the 5% they could take by statute. Um, I don't, uh, I'll be honest, Orange County's small and <clears throat> I do not take the 5%. And um, I just feel it's, you know, would it be best for to be 100% publicly funded? If I had my way, I'd say yes, but I'm only one of 14 sheriffs and that's just my own personal opinion. <clears throat> well, and you know mine. I know you, you've you been helping us and we really appreciate everyone on, on Senate GovOps. We really do. Um, we know we, we, got your, we got your support, so thank you. So any more questions or comments or anything for Jennifer or Bill? Allison, I see you're unmuting yourself. I, I am, I was, I was just curious, Bill. Thank you, thank you for this. Um, how many of the 14 don't take the 5%? I'm not, I can't be 100% sure if we had a few new sheriffs, so. Um, can can I not... throw something in here? Sure. There's, there's a couple different ways of taking the 5%. That's so right. So the sheriff, the sheriff, him or herself, is allowed to take the 5% for their own, for themselves. In Wyndham County, <clears throat> I do know that Keith Clark and I assume that Mark Anderson is doing much the same. They don't. They take the. They put that five percent into their budget, so that they 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 don't take the five percent for themselves, but they put that into a like. I think he used to put it into a special fund for equipment and stuff like that. So it isn't part of the regular budget. They plow it back into the yeah. operation. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. You're Thank welcome. You. And some some sheriffs might take five percent of one and then nothing of the next one or whatever, if depending on um, how overworked they might feel for their salary level. Jennifer. I'm also a small county and I don't take um, the 5% of the contracts either. It goes back to the department. So I plan on doing that um, for several years to come as long as I'm blessed to be in this position, so. 
And how long have you been in that position, Jennifer? Seven months. <laughs> <laughs> Since town, no, that's not a town meeting. That's a general election. Or were you appointed? I was appointed by the governor and I'll have to, yes. So any more questions or comments? Thank you so much. And on um, <clears throat> next week, um, I believe we're going to be looking at the um, budgets, the governor's proposed budget. And um, hopefully, I, I don't know if there are any changes in the budgets for the sheriff in terms of, of the uh, transport deputies and how, how that, um, if there's any changes there, so, but we will, we've contacted um, the uh, Sheriff's Association and um, John Campbell, who administers the funds for the, the state funds for the sheriffs run through the Department of Sheriffs and State's Attorneys. So we will be looking at that next, I think Tuesday. Yes, I, I'm aware of that. And also, I'm also aware that um, I believe we were, um, we were looking at the per diem transport budget. Mm -hmm. We were gonna take some, I think um, a percentage of that and a percentage of the mileage. Because um, due to COVID too, you know, there's been less transport, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will look at that on Tuesday, the, how the budget is going to work. So. Very good, thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, sure, thank you everyone, Senators, thank you. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> so I think that um, I, there, we did have uh, Gwyn, but we kind of talked about <clears throat> the municipal grants uh, last yesterday. So I'm not sure that there was any more. I see Damien is with us. Um, and I can't remember why, Damien. Madam Chair, we're gonna start with the burn pits at 2.30. So right. We have a couple of minutes until then. And Damien, is that why you're with, oh, Brian. Well, I just noticed on the uh, agenda that John Campbell was supposed to be with us today. Um, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I think that was a mistake. I think oh, that was okay. my mistake. I think that um, <clears throat> I put sheriffs on there for today to talk about the COVID. And then I also put okay. sheriffs on there to talk the about budget. the budget. And that was my mistake. I just got okay. confused. Yeah, <clears throat> because he, he really didn't, um, he has nothing to report about the COVID funds. And the <coughs> so what time is it right now? 218. It's what? 218. Oh, okay. Well, we have a couple of minutes. Do you wanna take a break or do you wanna just chat? Whatever your pleasure is, Madam Chair. <laughs> well, it's up to you guys. So Chris Bray, Yesterday in the meeting, you said, did I have a few minutes after the meeting for a phone call? And I called you 23 times. Wow. Really? Yeah. I, I didn't notice my phone rang twice. I went off to two more Zoom meetings and didn't finish till like six o'clock. Oh, okay. Um, we're in the, you know, the, there's this black hole. Well, there are many black holes in the universe. One of them is labeled... <laughs> Act 250, and um, so we're trying to sort out, you know, the administration came back with a very significant, large, significant proposal to, um, you know, come to an agreement on Act 250, which I think everyone would welcome, uh, but it ain't easy anytime you, so as soon as I left, I was back into trying to hash out the issues in Act 250. And um, I'm still hopeful, but it is 
<laughs> it's making me wish we would adjourn for the year. <laughs> Get a budget <laughs> and be done. <clears throat> I would vote yes for that. <laughs> no, I want, I, I, we have three bills that I really want to see passed. Oh. To get back to us. 233, yeah. which we know has just insignificant changes. And 220, I don't think there's going to be any significant changes. And um, 124, I, I don't know about because the whole committee hasn't talked about it yet in the House. But we want 124 to pass. We've been yes, working. we do. We want bills. all three of them to pass. There's no controversy either. Well, it, well yeah, maybe on, on which. 124 will have more discussion because of the whole uh, social justice uh, and policing issues. You know, it will have a lot of discussion in the House. Yeah, I, and I, I do understand that, but I think that unless they start putting in mandates in there, we've asked for all the, the information to come back to us in January. And I think that there, um, I, I suppose the House could Put, start putting mandates in there instead, like around the body cams. <clears throat> Somebody was concerned that we didn't require it of all, all law enforcement. And if we're going to require it of all law enforcement, then we better pony up some money and pay for those right. local. Right. So uh, we've asked for a study to come back and have a, a policy and look at that. Um, and <clears throat> the same thing with the militarization and use of militar, military um, surplus the, I, I don't want us to put a blanket thing in there that says no military surplus equipment, because a lot of it is radios and, and equipment and that no kind of stuff. And, yeah. and, or desk, and, desk chairs and desks. And, I mean, but, it isn't all submachine guns and tanks. Right. <laughs> but that's, the, that's where people's mind goes. And, and I'm afraid that they're I'm going to be pressured to do those kinds of things in that bill instead of asking for um, time to get more information on them. <clears throat> oh, we're, yes, because at the moment we just have studies on those. That's right, on both those things. Yes, we, we just asked for them to. I see June is with us. Hi, June. Are, Hi. You, in a pub, are you in a public setting? And at City Hall in Burlington. Oh, oh. for your count. Yeah. Oh. Do you want us yeah. to put masks on so you feel better? <laughs> no, no, you're all good. <laughs> well, I don't have one here, but I can pull up my turtleneck. <laughs> I considered walking to my car and doing it there. Then I thought, oh, you're really <laughs> fading in and out. I'll take this off if I have to speak. Oh. Well, no, it wasn't. It was the connection, I think. Oh, yeah. It was it kind of very touch and go here. At City Hall? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm using the hotspot on my phone. Um, so I could try to connect to the public Wi Fi and see if that's any better. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, I, I had a question about what we were just discussing before June arrived. Which, okay. You know, like on the law enforcement related issues. So, yeah. I mean, I think one of the sort of troubling <clears throat> phrases because of the way it gets used, it means so many different things to different people, the quote unquote defunding of police. Um, you know, it could be that you change, the, you change the scope of what happens. What if you now address mental health issues by having police departments include someone who's a mental health worker, for instance, you know, you, you would need to fund that position. I, so, so anyway, I don't know if that kind of discussions part of what's on the list of things that you're thinking about considering or. Um... Well, <clears throat> um, I don't think we specifically, I, I mean, I'm, we've passed 124. Right. <clears throat> I have no suggested changes to it. Okay. I don't know if you do or not, but no. we <clears throat> we didn't address funding, I don't think, but we did address, um, I know we addressed the training that right. they needed to look at that. And and I know that there is some movement to, to put um, social workers or mental health workers in police departments. And right. a number of them have, and there's a difference between having a mental health worker and a social worker. 
in your right. police department. Yeah. And it's how what you want to do, what you want that person to do. Yeah. So having a community conversation here in Bristol um, around uh, safety, security, and policing. You know, right. With the notion that safety and security is a much bigger sensibility than just policing. You know, there's so we're talking about everything from having a good rec program and parks and concerts and neighborhood events <coughs> uh, to um, you know, police work as well. So one of and one of the things that I found was interesting was that I don't know if you're getting the letters from the ACLU. It's a form letter that people are sending yeah. out now, and it, yes, it, it I was generated. About. Yeah, it was generated by ACLU and. One of the things in there says to not have police involved in low-level um, <clears throat> misdemeanors and uh, low-level offenses, such as um, oh, I don't remember the examples that were given, but to remove police from them because they have too much discretion. But the the Burlington study, as I as I understood it, said that there was definitely racial imbalance on the um, higher, higher um, crimes where they didn't have discretion. There was much less racial imbalance on low level crimes where the police actually had discretion about whether to charge or not and how to, how to do that. So I found that very interesting because if you take away that discretion, then you're going to have, the, that's the way I read the, the study. I don't know if anybody else did or not and if that's the way you interpreted it. Yeah. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't read it. Um, we also took some, you know, the committee, so we had a community conversation uh, nice. a few weeks ago. And one of the things that came up was this program out, I think it's in Washington state or Oregon called Cahoots. And it's, um, it's a, uh, I don't, well, we need to learn more, but basically it's a, it's a response to situations that need some sort of assistance and in, in cases where it may be more appropriate to have um, someone other than traditional law enforcement showing up to help take care of the situation. So for instance, um, uh, uh, mental health related things or neighbors in conflict over things that's, uh, Anyway, so we have more to learn, and I dog dogs barking, roosters crowing. Yeah, I've never heard as many roosters as now that I live in Bristol Village, <laughs> on our farm that was much quieter that way. <clears throat> well, it is interesting. You remember when we went on our tour? The um, <clears throat> police chief in Newport said the last thing that it, someone in a mental health crisis wants to see appearing on his doorstep is somebody in uniform with a gun on his hip. Right. But exactly. <clears throat> there, there aren't options out there and, and um, they need to, I don't know if you want them to not be there at all because it, things could quickly escalate and you need, so you need somebody on the front who maybe is the mental health worker who can try to de-escalate and get it there, but to have a an officer there for backup, well, I, I I don't know. I don't know. I, I I hope what we have are officers who are so well trained that they will be welcomed. I mean, you know, that's I think the goal in, in our training, in our asking to review and improve the training on many of this uh, these issues. I I would hope that people would. Uh, once they experienced retrained and more fully trained officers in these areas that people would welcome their presence, just as people are welcoming the presence of this wonderful HCRS edition in our Bellows Falls uh, um, uh, sheriffs, you know, of uh, uh, Vermont State Police Barracks. Well, there are people who are never gonna welcome the presence of a cop. Oh, I mean, right, right. You, we have to understand that. And, <clears throat> and they, they also will never be mental health workers. They, they simply can't be that they being a mental health worker requires a fair amount of um, intensive education and training training isn't the right word but 
<clears throat> so they need to know how to de-escalate and recognize, but they'll never be mental health workers. No, but they can have more training in, in, yeah, in that. Yeah. And certainly, it, I think that the be, the more training they get, the, the better they will be at de-escalating and figuring out how to pivot situated directions right. and, 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 you know, not end up having people terrified of them. Right, right. And, but there are some people who I would like to see remain terrified of police officers. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> So anyway, <clears throat> so who do we have, Gail, who do we have, um, who's going to walk us through the burn pit other than June? Do we have, I know we, in, I think um, the Vermont Medical Society I saw was on the list and. And Wesley, Wesley was gonna update us on his lawsuit. Good. I mean, he now has an active lawsuit. Good, yeah. Oh yeah, he was gonna talk about the lawsuit. Okay, so, so Bob Burke and Catherine. Hi, this is Catherine Long with Senator Leahy's office. Good, hi. hi. And who else is with us? Hi, this is Bob Burke from Veterans Affairs. Oh, Bob Burke. Okay, I can only see a few screens, a few people on my screen here. So you have to and tell Bob, me. Bob, Bob sent something that Gail has posted on our website. Good. Okay, and <clears throat> so we have right now June and Catherine Long and Bob Burke with us to talk about it. So June, do you wanna start us off and tell us <clears throat> what you see and where we are and what's been happening and what we need to pay attention to? Yo, uh, Gail, I'm sorry, first, Gail. Does anyone know who Elizabeth Alessi is? Yes, I do. So well, who is she? I admit her to the uh, Biz, uh, Biz Alessi is a, uh, I, I believe she's working in this area now, but she is a, uh, someone I know relatively well, and I don't know where she's working at the moment, but she's a good egg. Okay, thank you. She may be working in this field now, which is why she's joining us. Okay, <clears throat> so I see Elizabeth, you're there. Who are you? <laughs> she's... <laughs> She's, Hi, sorry. she's gone away. Now Jess is there. Yeah, sorry. This is uh, Jessa with the Vermont Medical Society. It's the um, we're having issues with our Zoom account, so it logs me in as one of my coworkers typically. Oh, but, great. Okay. So is Biz now working with you? Was um, Elizabeth Alessi is our program? Yes, our program and event manager. She's from down in your neck of the woods. So you uh, I know. know. I've known her her whole life. <laughs> she is, we love her. She's great. So I love her too. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's, uh, June, would you like to start us off here? Yeah, I don't have a whole, whole lot more of information from our last meeting um, mm -hmm. because I, I've been a little distracted lately. Yeah, we know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't know if any more has been done um, with the National Guard, but I'm sure uh, Bob Burke can speak to that a little bit. I, I had um, reached out to Ken Gregg, and I know that they were making um, some headway on getting the word out that, that uh, veterans and current military members should get on the burn pit, but I don't know what that number looks like at this point. My focus has really been with this team coalition, which is working on federal legislation. And so we have drafted the first um, draft and it's been submitted, uh, it's the VA, draft we're working on two, one that's DOD focused and one that's VA focused. This Good. is a VA draft that has actually uh, been uh, given to SVAC at a round table, not yet a hearing. And we're in the process now of reaching out um, to other, Senator Tillis is going to sponsor the bill, but we're reaching out to other um, members of Congress to see if they will co-sponsor. I have actually sent some of that information on to uh, Catherine Van Hayes to see if we could get um, uh, Bernie Sanders to, uh, to sign on to that. But locally I've been, I haven't seen any difference. I, what I'm curious about is um, if we are doing anything with the health uh, department to get that information out because I do know that we lost another military member 
recently a veteran who uh, had burn pit exposure and whether or not she got any benefit, um, I don't know. Okay. All right, so I, uh, well, I think we'll kind of do this as a, a, just a discussion. So if anybody has things to add in. So Bob, do you wanna, um, and, and then Jessa talk about what might be happening locally and with the Medical Society and, and the VA. Bob, if you want to, okay, there you are. Yeah, so hi, this is Bob Burke from I can't, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? No. How about now? You had me on before. Just barely. You're very faint. So from the state office, are. from the state office of Veterans Affairs, uh, we continue to push out uh, and advertise and talk about the registry. Um, the numbers of what I had sent to Gail earlier were numbers to show from uh, September 30th, 2019 through June of 2020. So in September of 2019, Vermont had 544 um, registrants. Uh, and as of June 30th of this year, that number is up to 661. So slow, but we continue to make process, progress. I'm not sure um, if the guard has started to make it part of their annual physical health assessment. Uh, I was hoping that somebody from the guard was going to be on today. That might be my fault. And that's my report. <laughs> I do know that guard has um, offered to, they have a couple um, traveling um, computers that they can send around the state to get people. And, and they have um, technical advisors who will go, will help. And Laura Savelli and I have talked about this fall, having them come down to Wyndham County for a day or two days and hit Brattleboro, Bellows Falls, Wilmington, and maybe Londonderry and um, get people to come in and register and have somebody from the guard there to help them. So Jessa, do you have any updates from the, and I did, I see, I thought I saw Shayla's name on here, but I think Shayla is on vacation. So uh, not too many updates. I believe I submitted an update. Boy, it's so hard to keep track of time now, but um, mm -hmm. it was when you did, <laughs> where we did a brief update in the spring um, when you were meeting and mm -hmm. So, you know, we've pretty much same status for us where we've put some information in our e-newsletter to our members and on our website. Um, but just as a reminder that we only represent a subset of medical professionals in the state and that VDH was also gonna be working with the licensing boards. Mm -hmm. um, I think both Board of Medical Practice and Office of Professional Regulation. So I don't know if it's gone out through the licensing boards um, or what the status is with um, sort of the Department of Health's piece of the work, but we have um, been working to share the information about the registry with our members. And are people responding? I mean, are the docs? I have not received questions about it. You know, I think it's it's been put, kind of put out there more informationally. Um, so I can't speak to sort of what um, the response has been. You know, obviously healthcare providers are a little distracted at the moment with a number of, <laughs> of changes to their practice and what they're learning and having to absorb every day. They're, they're, pr they're pretty overwhelmed right now or you know they had been over the spring. So um, the timing might be better um, sort of as we go into the fall, things feel a little bit more um, stable at the moment. So it probably we could put another reminder out there um, in the next month or so. And then we'll make sure that OPR does the same thing to all the licensing boards. Um, any questions or anything else? I think this was, um, I, I am sorry, I 
think I really blew it on making sure that we had OPR in the guard here. I apologize for that. I don't know where my head was. So, so Catherine, do you want to weigh in here? You, you just hi yourself. yeah no I'm I'm uh, right here um, no I actually didn't have anything to add I was uh, interested to hear um, you know how things were going uh, in terms of the state's efforts um, and am eager to hear more from June about the legislation it may, yeah it, uh, Catherine is Senator Leahy can going to join as one of those sponsors of this. Um, we haven't yet seen uh, the proposal. If it's gone to Senate uh, Veterans Affairs, he's not on that committee. So um, I'm happy to make sure that he gets a look at it and would certainly, um, he'd be considering it carefully. Absolutely. Catherine, I'll reach out to you. Thank you. Catherine, would you like, we have two Catherines here right beside each other. Would you like to weigh in? Hi, everybody. Sorry to be late. I was on the phone with the senator and uh, did not think I should hang up with him. So sorry to be, <laughs> be late to uh, talk to all of you. Uh, so I'm just getting my context here for what you're discussing. Can I presume it's the legislation that just passed out of Senate Veterans Affairs in DC? Well, we were just getting kind of an update on where we were with burn pits and June brought up the legislation that, she, that she's introduced and then we just wondered how, if anybody had anything to throw in about the, um, what's happening. With the burn pits. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so I think that the, the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, um, which Senator Sanders obviously sits on, um, met in earlier this month and considered some legislation having to do with burn pits um, that was passed favorably out of that committee. So that's kind of where things stand right now. Um, our thanks to June, who is very helpful in getting us some information um, on that. Uh, but I, I can sort of wait at this point and answer any specific questions you folks may have as the discussion continues. So go ahead, Allison. I, I think we'd just like to know sort of if you could give us a, a rough summary of what the bill entails that passed out of Veterans Affairs Committee. What, what, what what does it ask the feds to do? What does it ask the Department of Defense to do or the world to do? Do you want me to speak to that, Catherine? Yeah, I was gonna say, I wanted to give um, June the opportunity to do that since she obviously had a had a role in that legislation. So if it's yeah, all and what, okay with I, the I don't committee. I have it all in mind right now and I was just Told that uh, Ward Six memory card was just wiped out, so I'm a little. Uh oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you if you need to go in a few minutes, I will. But I will let you know. Um, what I will do is send um what it has been proposed if it's appropriate, and maybe Catherine can tell me if it's appropriate to send what's been proposed to this group or to Gail to distribute to this group. Um, is that appropriate to do? You've seen it, right, Catherine? Okay, so if I can, I send what we've done so far and it's being proposed. There is a, an NDAA letter that has also been drafted. I don't know, I'm a little behind in my email this week and so I don't know, there's an exclamation point beside it today. So I'll read that, um, but, okay. but it really is proposing one that we take care of our veterans so that they have the health care that they need. It's proposing presumption so that those who were to burn pits um, will get that health care because right now the way this it's set up is you have to prove that you were you were exposed to toxins from burn pits or other uh, uh, environmental toxins um, you have to prove that you have an illness that is considered a disability this is for disability claim and then you have to prove that the two are connected so this legislation um, takes out a couple of those so it just it, the presumption will be that you were exposed and that you are. So we have a long way to go on that, but at least the first draft that's VA focused has been um, at least developed, uh, delivered to SBAC to look at and it sounds like past. Um, so we're, we're moving in the right direction. Good, thank you. 
All right. Um, is there anything else? That, does anybody know about Wesley's suit? I just know that it's been filed. And uh, more than that, I've only know what I've read in the Valley News, which is mm -hmm. that. Okay. Bob Burke, you know anything more about it? I know that the VA was pushing back, saying that the time had run out on it, but I think that, I, I don't think there's been a ruling on that yet, but it was the last information that I read, again, you know, from the press, looked like um, they were leaning towards saying, no, the time had not uh, expired on the filing because, you know, there's contention about the date of diagnosis is, is basically what it is. Right. June? Wesley did tell me that he was going to try to attend, but he was in Maine and wasn't sure if he would have an internet connection. Okay. Well, and do you, do you have any update, June, on his, on his lawsuit other than the fact that it's still active? I only know what the article in the paper said. Yeah. All right, so any more questions or anything that we should address? I would, I would say that the uh, guard is willing to work with people to have, um, to take their little traveling computers and personnel on the road. So anybody who wants to um, set up some dates for them in their area, and, um, they'd be happy to do that. I, this, is, this is Bob Burke. Can I, can I ask a question? If either of the Catherines um, know anything, uh, HR 1381 passed out of the House. Is the Senate going to take that up? And that was uh, a bill to allow uh, survivors um, of people who had died due to burn pit exposure to then go in and annotate that in the registry. Uh, sorry, Catherine, go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> if you have a crystal ball on Senator McConnell's agenda. Um, if that I did. Um, uh, so there is, I just was looking at that legislation and as of now, um, there's no Senate companion to that bill, which would mean that um, the Senate would, like you said, likely take up the House version um, as probably won't surprise most folks uh, in this meeting. Um, the Senate has not been particularly busy as of now. Um, the U.S. Senate, that is, of course. Um, we, our adjournment, or sorry, our return date is scheduled for the 8th of September. Um, I think that largely on the docket, it will be focused on um, coronavirus response and also potentially funding the government because we are running up against that deadline as well. Um, it remains to be seen, I think, what other sort of general business operate, you know, typical types of business that we would take up will be considered. Um, my guess would be, um, without looking in my crystal ball, that if there's anything to be considered, there will probably be a large end of year package um, that might can, can include some proposals. Um, but anything, of course, that costs money, I think is going to be difficult to get across the finish line at this point. Um, the Congressional Budget Office typically considers anything that would extend benefits to have a cost associated with it. So that's a long way of saying I don't know, um, but we will certainly track it. Um, and as negotiations occur, you know, now to the end of the year, we will certainly keep this on our radar. I think that was a great summary. Thank you. Should we should we all um, go down to Washington, give them lessons on how to how to function? If you could suggest uh, to the leader that we could meet remotely and vote remotely, um, that would be a, a good place to start. <laughs> but yes, I think lessons are in order. <laughs> 
Anybody else have anything they'd like to say? And I know that this was, uh, I, I do apologize for not making sure that the guard and OPR and Department of Health were um, here. I, as I said, I don't know where my head was um, and I apologize, but I just wanna again, thank people who helped us get this through. And I think that even just, I mean, it isn't a huge, huge number, a huge increase, but it looks like we're making some progress. And if we can just get people, and this COVID thing, as Jessa said, certainly did impact the medical professional people in terms of, of how they were um, responsive and promoting this because of what they had, to, how they had to change their practices and everything. So, um, but we'll we'll keep an eye on it and um, keep thinking about it. So, anybody else want to say anything? Quiet bunch this afternoon. All right. Well, June, run down and see what you can find out about Ward 6, whatever that is. Yes, I will do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for hey. continuing to work on this. Thank you. Thank you. So committee, Absolutely. anything Thank else? Do we want to, you have anything else you want to talk about or anything? I'm all set. Nope. We're all set. So we're set for Tomorrow, you know, we are going to start looking at the, the governor's, budget. thank you, the governor's budget. And um, I did hear from the ethics commission and they have nothing to say. They said they're just fine with whatever, however the budget is right now. And um, they asked if we, they, we wanted to have a report from them on what's been happening and everything. And I thought we should put that off because we need to deal with the budget stuff first. So we'll hear from the uh, Racial Equity uh, Advisory Panel and Human Rights Commission, hopefully, and um, the sheriffs and VSEA. And I think VSEA is going to have some um, issues around, <coughs> the administration has asked them, well, the budget is one thing, and then the administration has asked um, and this affects the budget to reopen the bargaining um, for the second year. Uh, and I know we're going to hear about that. So, yes. Damien, it, oh, I'm sorry, Allison. No, we've, we, it, there was a good piece today. I mean, NPR did a piece on it, and I, I think Digger did as well. So, okay, I, I did not hear that, but yeah. Gail? I, Oh, I'm sorry, do you want to go, Damien? I, I was just going to ask, can you uh, make sure to invite me whenever you uh, hear about that? Since uh, if there are labor relations changes, I'll be working with Betsy to uh, draft any, any changes to the Pay Act that might need to occur to clarify the legislature's position. All right, I'll send you an invitation for tomorrow. And as the chair said, we may not get to it tomorrow. It may go into next Tuesday. Okay. And, well, I that think that um, I, I actually think that tomorrow is going to be pretty brief because I think that the the uh, report on the budget from the Human Rights Commission is, probably isn't going to take a lot of time, nor the racial equity panel. And you were also uh, interested in hearing from the Women's Commission. So I invited the Women's Commission on their on their proposed budget. Yeah. And we have the sheriffs for next week. <coughs> oh, okay. We have them for next week. So I think that we will hear from VSEA tomorrow. I think that we have we'll have plenty of time. So sheriffs and DPS are on Tuesday. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Well, okay, thanks. so Here. great. So I'm trying to write um, a summary. Damien, you will get an invite. I, I, I'm trying Thanks to so write much. a summary. I'll see you guys of, tomorrow. Okay. I'm yeah. trying to write a summary of the CRF money that we've heard about so far. Do you want me to send it to you guys first to look at to just make sure that I'm really understanding? 
Thank you for sure. doing Yeah, that okay. would be good. That would be good. I, I, I'm going to scoot and go to a, my, the CSG Executive Committee meeting. Okay. Which I, thanks. Bye. Yeah. Bye. So I'll send it. I'll send it to you, and just make sure that I am understanding, because in my mind it's so complicated. My banker will tell you I'm not very good at money. <laughs> well, you're not alone, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Plina can probably attest to this too. Isabel, please. Um, we had a situation in Senate Ag this morning where we're trying to figure out, and I don't know why I think it's more simple than it than it is. How many farmers have applied? Is it a large farm, a medium farm, or a small farm? And how many people have had checks issued? To me, that was kind of like the procedure that we wanted yeah. to find out. But it's not an easy answer to get. And I'm not blaming any of the agencies. It just, the workings of government, even at the state level, seem to be so slow <laughs> that I thought by this time, I mean, we're looking at September in a couple of days, and I don't see a lot of, progress being made it's you know applications take two weeks to go through and it i don't know maybe it was just my own uh unique way of looking at life but i thought yep i lost a million bucks here's a check for a million i lost fifty thousand here's fifty thousand and it, it's not that simple so when um uh erica was speaking i was kind of lost too i didn't i still don't know whether that 53 million does that come out of our COVID relief or does it no, come out of FEMA? It comes out of FEMA. Okay. And then <clears throat> there are things that won't be covered by FEMA. Right. And then there are things that um, the match that the municipalities and the agencies have to put up will come out of our COVID money. Yeah. But where I'm confused is the relationship between that 15 million that's going to cover uncovered expenses from FEMA and the 12.1 million for the municipalities. And I know that some of that will go for hazard pay. And uh, so I, that's the relationship that I'm not entirely clear about. Yeah. And I don't, again, I probably sound like I'm whining. I don't mean to. I'm just no. making, I'm making the point that what we do in this situation is very important to people. And, you know, I talk to radio people almost daily. And, uh, I mean, I talk to people on the radio almost daily. And I get the sense that they're still frustrating because what I said to them in June still hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you're right. Well, I know with, you know, people with their Department of Labor stuff, there are still cases out there yeah. lingering. I mean, there was one family that I think only a week or two ago um, did finally, you know, they sorted things out and they started getting money. But they've, they've had claims pending all the way back to March. Yeah. Wow. So they were, as you can imagine, they were, and there were three wage earners in the family all unable to work so they were very stressed out <laughs> and, and frankly i was getting very stressed out along with them trying to you know through emails calls etc help mm -hmm. them get it sorted out it's, uh, surprisingly difficult yeah anyway okay well i'll send i'll send it out to you this afternoon i'm going to go down and try and work on it right now and then get it sent out so Okay. So okay. let's see. Tomorrow, we don't have an ag meeting in the morning, so we go from the floor at eleven thirty until and and then. And I think tomorrow. I think he said this morning that the eleven thirty was just going to be a token session. Yes, he did. And so our meeting tomorrow is when at one uh, at one one, one. one o'clock. Okay. So, so Chris Bray. Yeah. Can we speak now? <laughs> okay. If I go downstairs and call you? Will that work? I don't think we should speak live on YouTube. No, no, I mean, I phone. <laughs> and I just want to make sure I, there's two phones I can be called that. Do you have my number that begins with 371? That one, my cell I phone. I do, I do have that. Okay. You called that 22 times. <laughs> but well, I only left a message three times. <laughs> there was a, we, 
our house still has a landline. It's in a closet. And the only thing on it is um, the modem. And there's an old phone, old rotary phone in the closet too with it. And so I did hear that. I almost went in the closet to answer the phone. <laughs> Who's that? It's a secret call from Carter White. Okay. Okay, and I'll go down to my old landline that still has a crank on it and call you up. Okay. See you tomorrow. You. See you tomorrow. Right, see you later. Bye.